very interesting. So I'm going to present it to you and uh, with a great honor. And we started as well, as uh, I think you already know, the uh, 3D version of uh, Ritnason. We have this ingenuity system in our hospital as well. And this is great. As Francine said, you are going to get used to that. You, you won't do uh, anything but ingenuity. This is great, you know, 3D uh, surgeries. You don't, you know, uh, Mohamed Taufik, you know, I, I've seen videos from you in Instagram and Facebook and many other media. You do it so well and you have such an amazing screen on in front of you. And uh, uh, yeah. thanks a lot for, you know, for spreading these uh, this, uh, new versions of uh, Ritnosum as well. And uh, I would like, uh, Mohamed uh, Tofik, what do you prefer, us to call you Tofik or Mohamed Tofik or both? And, 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 and among of our, my colleagues, uh, the usual name is Tofik. Okay. Mohamed is, uh, is a, a famous name, and uh, among 100 people, 99 is called Mohamed. <laughs> So you, did, you cannot call Muhammad because everything, every time, uh, every people around you will call you Muhammad. So I, we are calling each other by last name, Taufik. Okay, okay, <laughs> uh, Taufik. Hi, hi, Christos. How is it going? Christos, give us from Hamburg. I know uh, you guys, uh, uh, I had the great opportunity after a Ratna meeting. I went to visit some uh, people around uh, Hamburg and also the iBank of Hamburg, uh, which is something attached to us here because we work in the iBank uh, of our city as well and the, the biggest iBank in the state and one of the uh, uh, most important here in Brazil. And uh, so I, I went there to find a friend and then I met Christos Kivas. It was a great honor and uh, to be in Hamburg with him. And uh, I'm pleased that uh, he's uh, participating in Red Nassum as well with us. Thank you, Dr. Skivas. And I uh, also uh, would like uh, Mohamed Tofik, uh, Dr. Tofik, to share uh, his screen. And uh, if you wanna say some words before you take off, you, uh, you know the, uh, the stand is yours. Yes, but I, I need uh, the accessibility to share screen because I need to be uh, a co-host, I think. Hi, Dr. Tafik, how are you? Co-host. Hi, are... Vibhav, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Hi Vibhav, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Dr. Tafik. I see you, Francine. How are you? Hi, thank you. All well. I'm planning to go to India. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll, I'll let welcome. you know if I'll go because I want to stay with you guys some uh, yes. for a week or for two or three days. We'll, we'll plan a trip for you to Taj Mahal as well. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Duffy. No, no, I just searching for how to. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Lee King, Lee King. King from Hong Kong. The Where? nice part of this meeting is that we, we are able to know a lot of people. We, I would like to meet you all in person, actually, because yeah. it's wonderful what Hudson does here. Yes, is my screen is on now or still not? Clear yeah, it's on. It's no, it's yeah. on. Yes, perfect. You yes. just have to, to put in the in in whole uh, screen. Yes, give me one minute. Uh, Dr. Lamb is going to come in within one hour as well. He's just confirmed to me. I have. I'm, I'm looking forward to Kerala. I think people tell me Kerala is the best part of India. Yes, it's beautiful. It's God's own country. So you got a lot of greenery, you got the backwaters. 
It's a beautiful place to visit. You must come. We'll plan something nice. Think that the topic is is uh, freezing. Yeah, probably he's got his, his uh, connection problem. But uh, let's wait a bit. So he's gonna come back in. I want to thank people coming over here, uh, like uh, Dr. Laercio, Dr. Samir, Roberto, Li King. Li King, how is it going in uh, Hong Kong? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hot in Hong Kong. Yeah, hot, yeah. It's a 19 yeah. p.m., I guess, no? Yeah, 9 p.m., yeah. We had to adapt the uh, time for also for Dr. Lam because now for Dr. Lam it's too early for him. So mm. it's uh, six ten over there, and uh, he's gonna join us uh, around seven. So uh, his time, Vancouver time. So time switches. He's in another area. So I think uh, maybe uh, I could share is uh, maybe uh, Kim Lee, uh, you could share your case before uh, Muhammad Taufik comes back in. You could start with your yeah, case. Okay. okay. Sounds good for you. Uh, yeah, of course. Yes. Okay. So So I would like to share a case of lamellar hole associated with retinal proliferation. So I would like to ask you for advice on um, how you would manage such case. And I would like to present one case I just do it two weeks ago. Uh, this is a 74, a 76 year old male with left eye uh, lamellar hole. Um, and he had uh, symptoms of metamorphosia, visual acuity of 0.4. And this is the OCT, and we can see there is a lamellar hole and uh, uh, an epithelium um, proliferation. Uh, uh, there is some proliferation over the lamellar hole showing in the OCT. So this is the surgical video. Uh, first, I inject the transcendental to stain the vitreous. Well, but I can, but I found that there is no stain around the. Um, macula just uh, the, around the fovea. So I have the diamond dust to scrape the posterior hyaloid to make some space for me to uh, induce the PVD. And then I induced PVD and then do the uh, vitrectomy. And then I inject some uh, glue to stain. There is no staining around the fovea. And I, I plan to have uh, peel the ILM and create a, a, a reserve the, uh, the, the ILM around the lamella hole. So this is the my technique to create the ILM flap. So I just create, uh, I peel the IM circumferentially at the macula and don't I did I didn't peel it off at the fovea. So uh, I peeled there is some uh, whitish uh, tissue around the at the fovea and I peel it just at the edge of the lamellar hole. I didn't peel it off. You can see that there's a yellow, yellowish membrane here. And keep it attached to the edge of the lamellar hole. And I make the uh, arm uh, peeling up to the both eye case.
So I keep the arm, arm at the hole and trim it by the cutter. But I preserved the yellowish membrane over the fovea. How fast you go for trimming without getting in the uh, the, the ILM? How far? I, I'm sorry. The, I just the do the cut, FAX in the end the, and, and inject the SF6. So that's the end of surgery. So what's your question? So uh, I at, at the post-operated day 12, the patient had the last metamorphopsia. The native visual acuity was 0.4. And this is the OCT, so uh, we can see that the lamell hole is closed here, and there is some uh, the epithelium tissue, uh, epi retinal membrane tissue filled the lamell hole here. So this is the end of the presentation. So I would like to you to ask you for advice on how you would manage such cases. Great, great results. I have a pretty good experience uh, with. Uh, lamellar or macula holes and uh, uh, your technique is, is very cool, very good and uh, they usually work well. Uh, what do you think uh, Francini? Could, could you comment on uh, Kinley's uh, case? Uh, Dr. Kinley, um, I thought your technique was perfect, you did it very well and um, sorry and yes. <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult because when you have the the um, um, limited membrane, internal limited membrane, very uh, adherent to the to the periphery of the hole, it's um, it's something that you have to concern because uh, otherwise you can pull it off and then you enlarge um, the macular hole. So I think you did it great because you preserved the 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 the, the the, 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 I'm sorry, yeah. I, I lost the word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did one case before a year ago and I peeled it off and the patient developed macular hole retinal detachment afterwards. So that's a very sad story. So I, I preserve the membrane now and then the hole heals well. Yeah, because it preserved the size of the hole. So that's what I meant to say. And 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 as everybody is using it for large holes and and uh, I think it's it's a great option to do it. I would like to know uh, if you may say uh, how was the final visual acuity for this patient? Oh well, because I just did it two weeks ago, so I cannot tell the final visual acuity. But he said uh, he can see better because the metamorphopsia is less and the scotoma is less. Nice, yeah, because sometimes this, uh, there's an internal limited membrane, they, they absorb, they, they disappear from time to time when you're seeing. And then the microperimetry, you can see that um, uh, the visual acuity is better in some place, and one year after it, it becomes better than it was near the surgery. So congratulations. Thank you. Andre, would like to make any comment? Andre, Andre Juca would like to comment. Yeah, a great, great case. Yeah, I, I think you were very careful to not to to, to av avoid in removing the IRM from the center of macular hole. You could end up with a full thickness macular hole. But uh, also in these cases, sometimes the yellow is very uh, hard to detach, and you have uh, sometimes uh, vitreous cases that can uh, be an issue and uh, induce uh, post-op uh, retinal detachment with PVR. These cases, uh, sometimes they are very tricky and you are very cautious to avoid uh, some of these uh, hard complications. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Li King. Cool case, very mm -hmm. good case. I'm going to show you later my case. It's similar to yours. And I was so happy with my case and uh, as I see yours as well. So uh, let me call our keynote speaker, Mohamed Taufik. Please, friend, and uh, you are free to uh, share your screen. Yes, 
but I have a, a problem because when I share the the keynote, once I play the the full screen, the whole computer is is closed, <laughs> and I don't know if I can work like this. You see also the the screen of the presentation now, or you don't see it? We see yes. it very well. Yes. yes, could I, I, I may ask to work like this because I cannot able to do a full screen because if I do it full screen, the, the presentation will close. There's no it's, problem. We, 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 may, we can see it well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's clear for you. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I will speak in my presentation uh, for a 10 minutes uh, about more usual technique to uh, to deal with a, a fibrovascular membrane complicated by diabetic retinopathy because here in our country it's a, a lot of cases uh, and the patient is coming in a later stage so we have uh, a lot of numbers of cases come in this stage so in such a, in this presentation i will demonstrate my tools and the variable tools that i use it for uh, uh, this such type of cases i will start it with my favorite scissor it's called uh, a curved blunt scissor, or valley scissor. It's mm -hmm. uh, organized by Dork, and I have no financial interest, but it's, it's organized by Dork. This is my usual technique when I go attacking the fibrovascular membrane. I usually starting to release the attachment of this membrane from a posterior hyaloid to anterior hyaloid, from the attachment of posterior hyaloid to this membrane to the anterior hyaloid. Make sure that the anterior part of the membrane is totally free from the anterior hyaloid before decided to attack this membrane by any means, usually even if it's a new manual, even if it's a manual. If I succeed to do this, freely release this membrane from the anterior to the posterior, I can attack this membrane by any means. And by such a, a, a type of cases, so my preferred technique to start with a probe to segment and then see if I can succeed to complete, I complete. If I don't succeed to complete, I go directly to uh, uh, a manual reading the scissor. Now, I can, as you can see, 360 degree, I succeed to release the membrane from the posterior vitreous, separating it from the anterior vitreous checking the membrane, the anterior edge of the membrane, the, vit the vitreous. Now I'm starting to attack the membrane. You can see now, I start using the cutter, elevating the bridge, segmenting the post membrane. As you can see here, I segmenting the membrane to make it post membrane, one on the right, one on the right, using a cutter. This video is edited by X2, so this is not a normal speed of my surgery. I just segmenting the membrane at one part of the membrane on the right, and one part of the membrane has a lift. As you can see here, I use the, the probe to delineate the bridge and to delineate the cleavage plane that I need to work. So I now succeed to delineate the bridge, cut the bridge, segmented membrane, propose one membrane on the right and one of the membrane on the left. Using the cutter and go underneath the membrane to test if it's a broad adherent membrane or just a multiple AB centers. If I feel that it's a broad adherent membrane, I switch switch directly to the manual technique using the special forceps scissor because if the scissor is closed, it acts as a plant and instrument. By dissecting the membrane, more than cutting the membrane, it's helped me to decrease the incidence of breaks, decrease the incidence of bleeders because the bleeders is come more with cutting, not by dissecting. So I use this technique by closing the scissor, use it as a plant, moving underneath the membrane, dissecting it. If I succeed to dissect, complete the sec. If I found any epicenters sticky, I just open the scissor and cut the epicenters. And we succeed at such a moment. So I move more and more for more cases to demonstrate a lot of cases. This is another type to demonstrate how when that scissor is closed, it acts as a beautiful dissector. You can see I am underneath the membrane, closing the scissor. It's totally blunt all around. And you don't fear about any problem for creating a break while this scissor is closely underneath the membrane, acting as a dissector. You can see when I found an epicenter like this, I just opened the scissor and and cut this membrane epicenter, 
and complete my dissection. So I usually close underneath the membrane by dissecting. If I succeed, complete dissecting. If I found any epicenters with difficult of dissection, just open the scissor and cut the epicenter and we succeed. This such type of uh, severe uh, membrane with covering all the posterior pool, as I said, I just, before starting dissecting, I complete separate the membrane from the posterior vitreous to the anterior vitreous. So make the anterior edge of the membrane free, attacking the membrane from posterior to anterior, using the technique of clothing the scissor and lifting the edge to hold it by the forceps and starting dissecting all through. Keep all the technique of dissection the dissecting is going with me. As you can see here, I just close and dissect. If I succeed, I go and complete. If I don't succeed, I open and cut the epicenters. And believe me, it's a very useful instrument and very safe underneath the membrane. If you are keeping it closed underneath the membrane, it may it uh, looks like very safe. When I have a, a, a large number, a, a huge part of the membrane dissecting, so I use the cutter to, to shave this membrane to make the grasping power of the forceps more controllable because if you are have a, a large number or, or a, a large size of the membrane dissecting, we are not able to control the grasping power of the forceps over the membrane because you can create the break by not, not by the scissor, you can create the break by the tangential force of the forceps you're creating over the membrane. So if you have you're dissecting a large number of the membrane, don't complete. Shave this part of the membrane to have a small part. You can control the grasping power of your uh, forceps over the membrane. Don't create a break by anteroposterior traction over this membrane. Like if I have a combined traction and rheumatogenous retina detachment and the retina is totally detached, I use what's called trimanual vitrectomy. I put a PVC covering all the posterior pool and using the BFC at the third hand supporting the retina while I dissecting the membrane like what I'm dissecting in the, in the previous video. Gentle holding of the membrane by the forceps in my left hand using a scissor by clothing it as a dissector underneath the membrane like you can see and the BFC pushing the retina so make as a third hand, make the, the retina is uh, stable and don't going with me while I'm doing a tangential traction by the forceps. And also the BFC helped me to control at somewhat the bleeder. So if we have a bleeder point while I'm dissecting, the BFC make like a hemostatic, temporally hemostatic for this uh, epicenter. And believe me, it's not going like this if you have a huge membrane with a large detached retina. So if you need to use this technique, use it as a small area of detachment because you can control the amount of the PFC you put it because if you have a huge detached retina, you will flat the posterior pool and this fluid will accumulate anteriorly and the, the job will be more difficult. I usually use this technique if I have just a posterior detachment, posterior pool detachment. I will go further for more videos to demonstrate my uh, another technique of using uh, attacking the TRD. If I have a small fibrovascular membrane like this and tangential traction over the macula, if you have this such a type, you can believe that the posterior hyaloid is totally adherent. So my preferred instrument in such a case is the pick. You have like a pick or 3cc syringe bended from at last part, go with the pick and elevate the posterior part of posterior hyaloid from the disc. This part of surgery creating the, the plan of your surgery. You can now switching for the cutter and segment and searching for the plan of the posterior hyaloid. If, if you have a huge uh, or we have a firmly adherent posterior hyaloid, it will be demonstrated more in such a type of cases. I have a totally adherent posterior hyaloid. I cannot separate the posterior hyaloid posteriorly I cannot separate it from anterior to posterior, so I start starting the surgery posteriorly over the disc and use the pick to elevate the posterior hyaloid and make the blend that I can go underneath this plane and segment the membrane or searching for the posterior hyaloid, elevating the posterior hyaloid and searching for the blend. Because if you have a totally adherent or tooth adherent posterior hyaloid, you cannot elevate it 
from the surface of the retina or you can use separating the hyaloid from the surface of the retina. This pick is helping you to do the job. Just elevate it over the disc and you can complete the dissection anteriorly and separating the anterior hyaloid from the posterior hyaloid. If you're separating the anterior hyaloid from posterior hyaloid, the membrane is now become free, 360. You can go with the cutter and shave the membrane. If you have such a difficult case with very taut ad uh, membrane, with very adherent to the posterior hyaloid, use the pick to create the plan. Just go with the pick, cut, and create the plan. If you use your pick, believe me, it's very useful an instrument in a lot of cases, especially with taut adherent posterior hyaloid. The pick creates the bleak cleavage plane. You can create the plane and you can complete the surgery from posterior to anterior. Not like from anterior to posterior. My usual technique is going from anterior to posterior, separating the anterior vitreous from the posterior vitreous and make the membrane free. So I go posterior to anterior. If I have a totally adherent posterior hyaloid adherent to the membrane, I just go from posterior to anterior using the pick, separating the, the membrane segmented and go and searching for this plane and also complete it from posterior to anterior as you can see here. This is a very useful technique. It's if you if you can start if you can see me when I starting this surgery I stuck, I have no plan I have no plan entry, so it's very useful for you to to create the plan and to create how you attacking the membrane. Another very useful tools for me in such a very difficult case like this one. It's eliminated back if I don't have a chandelier. If I don't have accessibility for chandelier, this illuminated big as a light source and the big at the same time. So I use the forceps grasping the membrane after dissecting all the posterior attachment of the vitreous and the membrane is free 360. Attacking this membrane by eliminating big, it's very useful tools. It's connecting to the light source. It's connecting to the lights. I don't know where is the sound is coming, but if it's not announced for you, I can complete the story. Uh, uh, this illuminated bit is very useful technique and keep it in your table. You may use it at any time. Finally, is this is my only way to attack the fibrovascular membrane by scissor or by pick or by illuminated pick? It's not true. May I succeed after separating the vitreous attachment of the membrane to attack the membrane totally by the using the cutter? By the way, I have no accessibility 25 gauge cutter. I only use the 23 gauge because in my hospital we don't have accessibility 25. I just need to demonstrate how is the 23 can succeed to segment the membrane and shaving this membrane because I don't have the 25 gauge. But it's this is only golden rule if you need to go with uh, only the cutter and attack the membrane, separate the vitreous attachment of such membrane, make the membrane free. If you reach at this point, you can 100% able to shave this membrane. If you leave the vitreous attachment to the edge of the membrane, believe me, this job will be more difficult to shave the membrane because you are not able to attack the membrane and you may face a very dangerous step to catch the retina with you. As you can see here, this is after separating the vitreous attachment 360, the membrane become free. Now you can just go with the cutter, segment, searching for the break, uh, for, for the bridge and segment it, the surgery will be at that time more easy. You can see I just confirming that the membrane is totally free, 360. Now I can go with the cut with the vitrectomy probe underneath the retina, searching for the bridge, activate the shaving mode, just segment this membrane. And if you see, after segmenting the membrane, the part of the membrane is like a flower. You just go with the cutter over the, this part and shave it and it's a surgery with them. 
like you can see if you have in such a type of cases like this if you have a membrane attachment here and membrane attachment here this shaving will not succeed you will not able to shave like this because the membrane is attached to the vitreous over here and also this membrane is going like this so i will go there finally to my last video if you have this such huge subhyoid hemorrhage be careful because this hemorrhage you need to be deal with this as a fibrovascular membrane a huge fibrovascular membrane not acting that as you have just a posterior hyaluronic detachment and the surgery is done because in such a type of cases we have a very tight adherent posterior hyaluronic starting to to shaving the posterior uh, do a vitrectomy try to separate and searching for the cleavage plane the area that you will lifting the posterior hyaluronic i prefer to be away from the hemorrhage because you can see the hemorrhage what's uh, what's are going underneath the hemorrhage at such uh, a moment i searching for the the the, the, the place as you can see here this is the place the blood is coming out so i i see i i, I found the cleavage plane at that time i go directly 360 to separate and lifting this membrane and the uh, when i cutting at i deal with the posterior hyaluronic at such a cases at the membrane segment shave don't pull at the posterior hyaluronic directly to make a posterior hyaluronic detachment because you may face of a very strong epicentral attachment and you can create a break if you go directly and lifting this totally adherent posterior hyaluronic and thank you and i i'm sorry if i'm being late uh, to demonstrating such a type of uh, complicated uh, fibrovascular membrane cases Thank you Dr. Hudson for this invitation. Dr. Tonsi, congratulations for your surgeries. Um I uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy is something that I really like to be very end for and it's a surgery that I think it's a challenging surgery because sometimes it's not easy to find the cleave it's not easy to find a place to open the the high alloy sometimes is very tough and you did it very very well there are beautiful cases and Thank i you. like especially um uh your your way of using the pitch to create the 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 cleaver to create a, 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 an opening through the high alloy and then uh, being able to pull it off so because sometimes you have so many adherence so it, it's very tough because uh, uh, there are there are some um specialists that they used to to uh, to pull the high alloy from the disc yeah. and then if you if you have a lot of um tough adherence uh, near it sometimes you pull it off it and then you holes right mm -hmm. so i like it very very much how you did it and what you did that i really liked it too it was using the parkour carbon to desiccate to to find this plane and, and and taking off all those membranes because i i really don't like because uh, there are some persons who used to isolate them and yeah. left it there but i really like to 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 take it off take it off, every, to clean everything that i that i can because i'm very afraid of having some um pvr or secondary membranes uh, fibroglial membranes near that and then sometimes they can redetach the retina so i i think you did it very very well and i i was not supposed to to present a case today just uh, he be here like uh, commenting but i asked him with some to to show a, a small video here after your comments because it's something that i think you 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 gave me a tip today using the purple carbon because when you do this sometimes you have a, a massive bleeding at the end at their that tough phase so uh, i'm very afraid of using purple because sometimes you put a small amount of purple and just um to to flat the retina but if you can create some holes uh, during you are dissecting them sometimes the purple can go under the retina but as you did you, i think uh, you had a, a third hand helping you to do this with a uh, very elegant way of doing this congratulations thank you may I also make a comment 
Thank you. Um, Hot congratulations for the case. Very well done. Um, um, when I have cases like that, um, where you show beautifully how you do the cleavage, I like to work with viscoelastic. So I do the cleavage, I start a small opening, and then I try to separate the the membranes from the retina by using viscoelastics. I mean, I'm pushing viscoelastic, and it comes to a pneumatic cleavage between the two membranes. So I protect the retina because we all know those kind of cases. The, the retina is ischemic, so it means you have you can have you can induce breaks, and then the the case is getting much more difficult. So in using viscoelastic, you push the retina. And you push the the, the the members away from the retina, so you have more space to do your work with the scissors. And you did it perfectly and beautifully with the scissors. I also like to use sometimes the cutter. Uh, but if you, use Mohammed, elastic, you you use the viscoelastic uh, uh, as a, a massage cellulose or uh, helon or or, or it is didn't different with uh, whatever helon or something like that. Normal viscoelastic, no, not helon. Normal, normal viscoelastic. Mm-hmm. Normal viscoelastic and it works very nice. It works beautifully. Mm-hmm. Perfect idea, I think. Yeah, Mohammed. I uh, when you get the main brain, as you said, you gotta create a plane. If you pull it up, you might probably tear the retina. But the way you go horizontally, very gently, is a very good one because you know the main brain just uh, 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 peels off the uh, the retina. Of retina. So. Uh, your imaging and uh, your macular lens and your technique is uh, just great. Congratulations. By the way, Dr. Hanson, I need to uh, to add uh, some comment on about visualization. I, I never use the macular, sur- macular lens for my surgery and I don't use the green lens for the recite. Uh, I usually use the, the, the black lens for Oculus Pio. It's a small one. And I use it for a normal vitrectomy, for a macular surgery, for everything, because the heads up for ingenuity helped me for magnification. If I'm going for uh, for a macular surgery, if I'm going for a normal vitrectomy, so it's just a small macular, uh, small uh, black lens for oculus biome. This is just I'm using. I didn't ch- I didn't switch for uh, for macular lens or going for an, another type of lens. It's just only one uh, type of lens I use it. Great, great. The image is mm-hmm. perfect. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. And uh, Francine, you. do you want to show your case? Because I think your case is related to Mohammed Tofik's. Yeah, it's a small case. It's just so to, to show something that uh, when you do um, diabetic retinopathy, then so opa, I think I won't be able to. Sorry. OK, not a problem. And. Uh, I would like to invite. Uh, I'm using another computer, so uh, I don't sure, think sure. you let me to. Sorry, but it, it was a case that we have a very tough uh, retinal detachment, uh, traction of retinal detachment, and it end with a lot of bleeding at the end of the surgery, and that was was about to show that because uh, probably maybe as I said, I don't like to use. Uh, uh, peripheral carbon, I'm a little bit afraid of it because of the tears that can be made during the, the section. But I think um, I'm going to do it the next time, as Dr. Tompe said, and I will try to see if I have um, less uh, bleeding at the end because sometimes uh, Thanks a that, lot. that's what we have. So. Thanks a lot. And uh, we are together every week with uh, Francine and uh, retinagrandrouts.com. So great teaching for residents and fellows all over uh, Brazil and the world. These slides are usually in English. And uh, so uh, you are welcome, everybody that wants to participate. This is a great course. You know, we've been learning a lot with uh, Retina Grand Rounds. And I I have to tell you, Francine, I have to tell here publicly, uh, the two of our Retina Fellows that uh, took the uh, exam for the Brazilian Vitor Retina Society, they passed because they were studying through retina grand rounds. And uh, congratulations to you. And uh, we are very happy to, uh, to tell you that. Oh, thank you. So it's a very big uh, compliment, this one. Thank you. We are trying to do the best here. Thank you. All right. Uh, Olivia. Uh, Olivia is our neighbor here from Bolivia. And uh, como estas? Todo bien? 
Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we'd like to invite you to present your case, but uh, uh, please tell us uh, something cool about uh, uh, your city. You know, you live in Santa Cruz. I haven't had yeah, the opportunity yet to go Santa there, Cruz. but uh, I will. <laughs> Santa Cruz is a very hot city. Uh, the people is very kind. Uh, we like to party and it's very green. When you come here, you will be sweating, but everything is green. Um, you can take uh, uh, around uh, 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 the towns around Santa Cruz are beautiful. And I hope to have all of you here in Bolivia and Santa Cruz and La Paz also with Marcelo. Yeah, and uh, I know that you have your family uh, is a family of uh, ophthalmologists, no? I've been yes. uh, following you. My dad is an ophthalmologist. Uh, Romina, my sister, is a corneal surgeon. And Natalia, the little sister, is in the second year of, of retina fellow. Congratulations. And uh, if you, you want to present your, your case uh, by now, uh, you are free to, to show and uh, the stand is yours. Thank you. Let me see. Are you seeing my my screen? Yes. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. I feel honored by the invitation to this webinar. Thank you. I am Olivia Valdivieso. I am from Bolivia. And I am going to present a case of uh, macular hemorrhage. This is a 48-year-old healthy woman presented with a four-day history of sudden visual loss in her right eye. The visual acuity was counting fingers and the patient uh, denied any medical history. A fundus examination showed a dome-shaped red hemorrhage in the macular area with a glistening reflex. The OCT revealed two distinct membranes a single highly reflective band corresponding to, it, to the ILM and the overlying membrane uh, consistent with the posterior heel. You can see here one and the overlying membrane. After a moment without a visual improvement, she presented with a dense vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, here we can see the V ultrasound that confirms premacular hemorrhage. Therefore, uh, we uh, a 25 gauge sutureless pars plana vitrectomy was performed. After removal uh, the vitreous hemorrhage, a posterior uh, alloyed detached what's created. We were able to identify the sub-ILM location of this hemorrhage, which showed a white discoloration. The ILM was stained with brilliant blue dye, and then the hemorrhage was aspirated after peeling the ILM. In this case, I used an end grasping asymmetric force tip. And you can see that after peeling it very carefully, here we can see the, the deposits uh, residual of the hemorrhage. After this, a fluid air exchange was performed and I aspirated the residual foveal deposits. At 
At one month, her visual acuity improved to 2025. The fundus examination, we can see the pre and the post. And this is a OCT after one month. Thank you. Amazing, amazing technique. And uh, all these uh, exudates just uh, uh, disappear. Great technique. If you couldn't have removed the ILM that way, they wouldn't have, uh, you know, with any injections, might not have uh, left the area. So great approach. And uh, mm -hmm. would like to, to comment uh, Sasamoto on uh, Olivia's case. Or maybe Christos give us. Uh, you are, you Hudson, are. I have some di <laughs> yeah, difficulties with the connection. Please give me two min more minutes. Sure, sure. So, uh, Christos, uh, give us uh, your mic. It was, uh, Olivia, congratulations. Uh, perfectly done uh, surgery. Was the bleeding, uh, how many How many days was the bleeding old? Because this, this yellow... Uh, color uh, could it was could be a sign that it wasn't uh, a few days old or a few weeks old. One month when she presented, one month. Okay, it was under the ILM that they under the mm -hmm. yellow, and mm -hmm. she went and after one month she came with uh -huh. this fresh. Uh, wasn't a fresh bleeding. Okay, yeah. very nicely done. But the yes. I did. Well, when I comment, uh, Mohammed uh, Tofik. Oh, uh, yes, the, the, the beauty of your technique, Dr. Olivia, is also when you peel the ILM or you peel around the, the blood, you just go very tangentially because you don't need know what's happening underneath. And so you walk very carefully because going circumferentially, tangentially, not going like this because you don't know what's underneath. So it's a very tricky point that you're showing very amazing congratulations for your technique. And also the aspiration after fluid, after air, it makes the, 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 the blood is controlled for aspiration. If you go in a fluid, it may be dispersed like this. So we go for the, the air and then aspirating under air. It makes this yellowish material, it's like uh, controlled for aspiration. And I'm, it's very perfect. Congratulations. Dr. Congratulations. May I ask you something? Do you do the air fluid exchange in a passive or uh, uh, active way? I do, do it active, but I uh, always use a cannula with a soft tip. Uh -huh. Now, just because I think uh, that's what I thought, but I usually do it too. But when I have to deal with macular fovea very near, I prefer to change it to a pass passive way. You know, I use the, the charge fluid and, sorry, uh, charge fruit and then it's mine, it's mine sorry. and then uh, you can control you can be uh, kindly over it without having uh, um, any any t uh, without afraid of uh, touching or sometimes you can pull it because if it's a little bit more um, dense I think but congratulations mm -hmm. Li King, Li King would like to add any comment on the technique? Uh, yeah, so um, I, has, I didn't do it uh, on the change to subtle blood, and, but, um, you, but what's the cause of the subhyloid and the sub ion blood of this case? So what's the cause of the bleeding? I think it was a Valsalva. Uh, mm -hmm. Denied any medical uh, history of, of sickness, and she denied any uh, anything that can cause. But I think it was a uh, Valsalva because uh, uh, most of the cases in Valsalva are uh, uh, beneath the ILM. Okay, yeah. So because uh, my uh, my previous case before they the, the blood they just saw so. Uh, so I haven't tried to do surgery on this case before, but uh, but from your case, it's already one month and it's all blood, so it would be good to do it. So congratulations. Thank you. 
I think that in this case, after the month when she arrived again with the, the petrous hemorrhage, pars plana is the treatment of choice uh, because she was presented late with this hemorrhage. And maybe if, if, if you try to do a laser jack, but uh, this has some complications and other uh, points, but you can have, you will going to have still this uh, sub ILM hemorrhage. So in this case was, was good. May I ask a question? Uh, may I ask a question? And then I need to have a, like a pool answer about this point. If you have a, a multiple level of hemorrhage, sub hyaloid and sub ILM, did you wait for surgery or you just go for the surgery directly? Please, uh, uh, I need a comment for all of you. Uh, for me, I, I, if I have sub ILM hemorrhage, I didn't wait. I just go directly for the surgery. I need to know your answer, please. I go for the surgery. Well, uh, that depends on the thickness of the hemorrhage and the location of the hemorrhage as well. Sometimes uh, if it's very thin, you can wait. But uh, it's, it's thick and uh, over the macula area in the center of the podia. So I think uh, I I would do surgery right away. So if it's covering the fovea, you go surgery right away? Yeah, it's thick. It's, okay. it's it is very thin. Uh, I think you can wait. Thanks. Great case. And I uh, would like to welcome now also Dr. Wachim Lem, my professor. He just came in. It's a great honor to have you here, professor. And I'm very happy because, you know, we started this thing. And uh, since the beginning, I, I have to tell you, as I was explaining to Francini about her course, which I just uh, shared the link for everybody who could join us uh, weekly. Dr. Lem was for me and is for me uh, some, somebody that is teaching me so much and uh, uh, his uh, way of thinking, the way he teaches. You remember Dr. Lem, the first days when I started my fellow, I couldn't even uh, look too much of, uh, you, you know, the uh, new vessel, rather the uh, new vessel was up or down. You said, you gotta use this contact lens, you gotta see what you are seeing. So I learned it so much with uh, Dr. Lem and I'm always uh, very honored to have you here, Dr. Lem. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, um, uh, inviting me to join. I think uh, it's been a pleasure to see the evolutions of this uh, retinosome for so many uh, participants and all that discussions over the time. And uh, I think, uh, congratulations, Hassan, you've done very well. Look at all the uh, recognitions and things that you've done. Yeah, and also uh, Dr. Lee King already presented her case. And uh, I know because uh, your time is a little uh, forward than ours here if we compare. And uh, it was actually for her, but not for you anymore. So it's too early, <laughs> earlier for you. So I know we adapted the time because of you as well. And uh, if uh, you wanna present, and if you are ready to present your case uh, by now, we're gonna be happy to, to watch it. And the stand is yours. Um, let me, um, uh, you, you go on first. I have to switch computer to, to get the... Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So let me ask uh, Vibhab, you have your case handy? Yes, sure. And uh, it was an honor to meet Professor Lam in the APAO. And uh, so because of Retinosome, we already knew each other. That's just like mine also. Coming, yes. So, have what about uh, your father, Aaron? He's such a good person. Uh, he could probably join us uh, in another time. Yes, he can, for sure. And Aditya, Aditya, Aditya is a coroner specialist. He, yeah, he does pediatric ophthalmology. So, I'll be presenting a short case of something I learned. Initial days of my Yamane technique, I've titled uh, Skyfall. Can you see the uh, the presentation? 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Full screen is okay. And now, now it's, it's not full screen anymore. Yeah, it's okay. So this was a case uh, in which initial days of Yamane technique, I just wanted to share my experience and uh, what modifications I made after making the mistakes. This was a patient in which I've already done the vitrectomy, this is a kick patient. So I go on and place the three piece foldable lens in the anterior chamber. I've already created the markings around 2.5 millimeters on 180 degree apart and 2.5 millimeters on each side for my sterile uh, tunnels, which I'll be making. But uh, you think the, the smudge markings uh, become, they become larger in size. So after placing in the lens in the anterior chamber, just carefully is rotating it. So you see the marking actually was not in the right place. So I rechecked. So after going through, I used my max clip faucet to hold the haptic and uh, guided into the 26 gauge needle. You can see the cell infolding there at the needle haptic edge. So after docking it, I left it there. There you can see uh, after creating the uh, trailing haptic uh, holding, the mistake I already made is that I've, I've placed in the, I've not uh, yet uh, done the cauterization of the leading haptic. It's there in the needle, tucked in. So when I go in for the trailing haptic with the tunnel, I uh, I face difficulty here. So this is a step which I later on have modified. So because of the top, un, you know, the uh, kind of a weird position in which I was, I kind of created a skyfall. The, Leading haptic went back into the vitreous cavity, but I left it where it was, having patience. Right now, the eye is already vitrectomized, so I brought out the trailing haptic in position. And because the vitrectomized eye was there, so I was able to do these maneuvers and bring back the leading haptic. I placed the trailing haptic and I cauterized it first of all to secure it and went back for the leading haptic again. After placing it in my Tunnel again. I went back, took my time, and uh, brought out the leading haptic and cauterized it and was stuck it in the cell tunnel. And I was uh, the good part is I had done proper vitrectomy, so I got away with this. And this patient had a good design. Thank you. Very cool technique. You know, we've been doing a lot here at the foundation. The Retina Fellows uh, are doing pretty much the same. And uh, uh, we are doing like the uh, Yamani technique. We've been doing the uh, uh, Agrawal technique, the uh, modified Agrawal technique. This is so cool to do and uh, because uh, uh, you actually can hide the uh, haptics under a tunnel, the uh, intraocular lens gets very stable, and uh, your technique is very good because you you don't have that problem of you know uh, within uh, some time, some some years, the uh, insta instability of the uh, intraocular lens. So we are getting better and better with those uh, techniques. And uh, Andrea Jucá has a, a good experience in the intraocular lens uh, secondary implants and uh, fixation as well. And uh, recently, Andrea showed a case uh, for the first time in the uh, World Retina Congress about this uh, uh, intraocular lens. Uh, could you uh, comment on uh, uh, what have said this uh, case, uh, Andrea Juca? Yeah, congratulations. It was a good solution. Uh, one other option was uh, try to get the needle out of the eye through the incision and uh, then do it outside the eye. The insertion of the second aptic is sometimes is tricky. And then uh, you you can, instead of doing inside the eye, doing outside the eye would be also easier to manage. 
Yes, I think you're right. We underestimate the uh, locking of the trailing haptic and that is where it goes wrong. And that's mm-hmm. what I've always realized. So since that time, I've always uh, cauterized the leading haptic after I bring it out. So at least that is secure. And yeah. you know, then just with gentle maneuvers, as you're saying, uh, either bring it out or, uh, you know, just switch your hands in such a way that you're comfortable in locking it. Yeah. All right. Anybody would like to comment anymore? And uh, uh, Saad, how are you, my friend? How are you? Um, it's great to be back. Uh, happy to see all the good friends. Sorry for the delay. I was caught at the clinic. I just finished, but it's great to see you. Great, uh, great case, Dr. Sadi, as usual, and well, well managed. Uh, I remember Saad during our times in Toronto, in Canada, with uh, Dr. Lam. So. We learned a lot over there, and uh, we liked visiting in the last uh, year I was in Saudi Arabia, our uh, presidential meeting. That mm-hmm. was awesome, and uh, it was great to see Saad there and uh, people and meet people. And uh, you are always welcome, Saad, because you know you are uh, more than a very good retina specialist, a very friend of mine, and I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Same here. We really enjoyed having you. And hopefully we will, you know, get everybody um, to um, to uh, Jeddah, inshallah, in the near future. Thank you. No problem. Andre, Andre, uh, are you ready with uh, your case? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to, I have to see here. Hold on. Okay, this case is a case of uh, extra large, extra extra large macular hole. This uh, uh, this hole here that was uh, who, he came from another guy here that did the macular hole surgery, but uh, it happens an accident during the surgery because the patient moves and and the instrument touched the macular area. I do not have the video because it was was performed elsewhere and uh, and the guy was not recording because it was a regular uh, case. And then uh, after the gas bubble absorbed, the patient have a much bigger macular hole than initially. So this was uh, the case you, you see the eye with uh, with uh, gas still and a big uh, extra extra large macular hole. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the minimal large diameter was 962 micrometers. And uh, it, we see this uh, from the new close study group uh, proposed this uh, classification for macular holes, and our case uh, is uh, an extra, extra large macular hole. So uh, the, the study also proposed some uh, techniques uh, for these special cases, uh, for these uh, large uh, macular holes, uh, the IM peeling and flaps and the extra large still works very well, but for extra extra large macular holes, uh, the SUSEX rates uh, decrease, uh, except for amniotical membrane and autologous retinal transplantation, there are better SUSEX rates. Based on this study, we uh, decide to perform we we want to check to see if there was any uh, any uh, internal membrane left. There was not very much. We saw uh, some lesions in the and some adhesions from the retina to the retinal epithelium. We removed this uh, this adhesion that was caused by the previous surgery, the the uh, surgical trauma, and we're trying to to see if there was some uh, some addition and the mobility of this this uh, flap uh, since this was a, a trauma case with uh, extra extra large macular hole and we see that now uh, it's uh, it's liberated and there is no no really adhesion and no more 
no more limited membrane in po posterior pole. Then we decided to do a macular hydrodissection uh, and we put perfluor carbon to avoid uh, the fluid coming uh, through the macular hole. So this uh, will give perhaps more space to uh, the macular hole close itself was a very big. Still, we feel that uh, could not be enough. It was so big, the macular hole, and we decided to put uh, an amniotic membrane that we here is called with uh, with uh, uh, brilliant blue to uh, to see better the choral phase of the amniotic membrane that uh, we try to put uh, over the macular hole. We are using here this uh, this Alcon uh, device to dislocate the flap and uh, this finesse uh, device and we are putting it uh, over the macular hole like a band-aid, like a patch and uh, we are putting it over the macular hole and the, the eye is over perfluorocarbon liquid, so uh, we're trying to put this as much as we can. And then we put uh, some uh, a glue, a biological glue, to keep it in place after uh, the surgery. And this is uh, uh, three weeks post-op. Uh, the patient with, is with gas, C3F8. And we see that uh, the amniotic membrane is covering well the macular hole, uh, we see here, but there is some still some gap to fill. We think that this migration may happen in the next uh, few weeks, and uh, the vision we might expect have some improvement. Yes, that's, uh, we bright this, uh, thank you for your attention, this new uh, use uh, classification that is modifying our approach for these very, very large macular holes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And uh, let me ask you, if you uh, uh, had done this, uh, such a beautiful technique, the good imaging, and uh, you put the membrane just on the macular hole, and uh, uh, how do you think it's going to, with time, heal or create a scaffold to actually close the uh, or produce this uh, uh, tissue to close the whole uh, the, the whole uh, structure of the uh, the retina? Uh, would you do anything uh, more like uh, in injecting some gas or doing something different? I would just uh, wait until it heals more. Yeah, the, the patient indeed is, is still uh, under gas, uh, you see. Uh, so we are still, uh, we still have about a month or, or so of gas in the eye. And we, we think that with time, uh, there is going to be some migration here. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, this was a really extra, extra large macular hole. And the data was that uh, the membrane and miniotic are one of the best options. Another option would be a retinal or autologous transplantation. Uh, the internal limited membrane flap was uh, less had less success rate in these uh, extra extra large holes, and we still hope that uh, this migration will happen. Uh, it's important to uh, to from the study data to know that the you not, should not put anything inside the hole, since this will avoid the migration of the internal segment, segments of the photoreceptors and it will avoid the formation of external limiting membrane. So if you put this inside the hole, this is not going to be very good. But uh, if you put on the surface, uh, you can do it uh, also with uh, autologous retinal transplantation. But then you have to cut the retina and uh, move it for this location and do about the same over the retina or, or 
uh, inside the retina also, but inside the retina it seems to be less advantageous for retinal regeneration. So we try to put over the retina, not inside, and wait for this migration with time occurs. All right, and uh, okay. the, the classification that you showed us, this, yeah, was, the, a, this, was, a, this was published by uh, the first author is a good friend, is Flavio Rezende. He, he just uh, proposed this classification with the objective of uh, changing our uh, way of doing uh, surgery in this very large macular holes. This is the study that was published. All right. And Andre, can I ask you something? I was, I was, uh, what is this glue that you used? What is this? Um, you said <coughs> like you used something like a glue on top yeah, of the retina. Well, yeah, what is yeah, this? We, we use uh, uh, this biological glue that uh, uh, the uh, guys use to pterygium surgery. We have a lot of it. And uh, membrane amniotic from, come from these guys to they do a PT region. There is a lot of PT region here, and uh, but they use it uh, amniotic membrane to to uh, in these tough cases of PT region, and we did the same. We just but uh, is it two drops? Is it um, uh, is there some 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 risk of this glue coming into the macular hole because the OCT it looks like a PFCL bubbles, so some kind of PFCL bubbles. It looks, it looks like this has the same. Uh, it looks like the same picture. Could it be glue that migrated to the hole? Yeah, it could be the PFCL. Hole. We use the PFCL, hole. but the glue was over when we put this two drop of the glue, and it disappears. It stays only a, a few times. This the glue is from uh, from the blood uh, itself, so it's not going okay. to stay for a long time. Although the amniotic membrane is going to stay, it's not going to disappear. But there is some uh, guys okay. that show that micro perimetry uh, do not, uh, is affected by the membrane. So the vision should not be affected by membrane. Yeah, it, it looks yeah. like the, the PFO bubble, but uh, I think it's just the, the macular hole that's still open. Okay, uh, very impressive, Andrew, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, there. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, this classification that I'm uh, just put back there, you know, does not contemplate the, uh, uh, I would say, the, you say that uh, the uh, uh, stuffing technique, the t stuffing technique could be the autologous uh, retinal transplantation, not a retinal transplantation, but the autologous insertion of the uh, ILM flap. So do you think where in, into this classification, Andre, could you put the stuffing technique? Could be in the middle or uh, the percentage for uh, large macular holes? Could it be between ILM peeling and ILM flap? Yeah. Uh, uh you have to do the I am peeling first, and then uh, this case was already done. The I am peeling, so I just put it over uh, because there was no more. I, I was thinking in, in the first of the surgery using and rechecking to see if there was a good I am peeling, but it was a very good I am peeling, a very large one, and then uh, we have no uh, internal ma limited membrane to cover it. There was another option, but in this very large case, the study, the close study that showed uh, that uh, uh, amniotic membrane and uh, retinal auto graft is uh, are better options. Okay, we okay. have better closing rates. Did, did you comment anything, uh, Li King? I think you were trying to comment. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the great case. So I had several questions. So uh, you use the fresh amniotic membrane with staining. So will, will you place the staining up or down uh, when you place the amniotic membrane over the hole? And my second 
question is um, how to make it flap under the water that because the membrane will fold uh, when you place it over the macula. And I did the third question is have you tried the dry AMT before uh, to cover the hole and uh, and what, can you compare with it uh, with the fresh AMT over the hole of the results? Uh, because I did one case before I had a uh, I had a, um, a 80 something year old man with macular hole and did the surgery, but it complicated by macular hole detachment. So I did the uh, surgery. After the uh, fluid air exchange, I placed a dry AMT membrane over the hole and, uh, and then an ingest silicon oil because he had a macular hole membrane and uh, macular hole detachment. And after uh, one to two months, the hole closed under the silicon oil. So I would like to ask you for the any experience to compare the the different AMT for the macular hole closure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, first for the uh, question of uh, staining, I try to stain the chorion of uh, the chorion side of the amniotic membrane that should be covering the retina. That should be over the macular area. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it the the brilliant blue is just to facilitate to see which side because when are inside the eye it, it's very difficult to see if you are over the corneum or, or or over the epithelium and uh, uh, for the uh, dislocation of the amniotic membrane uh, the peripheral carbon facilitates it to put over the the macular area if you try over fluid, uh, it, uh, it does not uh, stay. So uh, it may be done, but it's much more difficult. So with uh, peripheral carbon fluid, uh, it's much easier to to come from the periphery to the macular area and go slowly and yeah. um, carefully dislocated it Maybe until it, it uh, covered like a, a band aid or a patch over the, the macular hole. So uh, about the other cases that i done, I have some other cases. Uh, they are all uh, very uh, big holes and uh, the vision uh, improved a little. But uh, as showed in close study also, most of the cases, the vision improved a little bit. But uh, these are very big holes and we do not expect, although this patient was done a few weeks ago, uh, we do not expect, uh, uh, we do expect some improvement, but uh, it was uh, a bad case and uh, this case is, uh, we really try to do something for the patient, but the vision will, will not be the best one. We had another case that uh, all the patients, they said that was a vision improvement and uh, the microperimetry also so show uh, visual improvement in these cases. Thanks, thanks. Very cool case and very well discussed, André Juca. Uh, next, I would like to call uh, Marcelo and after Marcelo, uh, Professor Lem. Uh, Marcelo, would you like to share your screen? Sure. Uh, sorry for the delay. Let me see. So you live in the same city as uh, Olivia, Bolivia, or you live close? Yes, I live in <clears throat> La Paz. It's uh, by plane like one hour, more or less. So Cochabamba is in between La Paz and uh, Santa Cruz. Exactly. I want to visit you, guy. I'm so close. I'm okay. waiting. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> we are almost relatives, you know. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Let me check this first. We were uh, teaching with the guys from Sao Paulo two days ago, and uh, we were talking about altitude and intraocular gas. This is very interesting how things work in Bolivia, and uh, the altitude is so high. Yes, some, uh, sometimes uh, we got some conflict with uh, the use of gas. Um, it's the, the time of uh, 
that the gas stay in the in the eye is totally different from other cities. So we we try to manage uh, to to perform uh, good surgeries, especially with with the use of C three F eight. C three F eight. I'm ready, uh, Hudson. Okay. So first of all, can you see my my video? Yes, it's great. Okay. Well, I just want to mention the use of stains when removing a membrane. So this is a fake vitrectomy. In this case, I start using first uh, triamcin alone to recognize the membrane, but I didn't have much luck. So uh, later I put the Brilliant Blue mixed with a little bit of triamcin alone in the same syringe with the idea of uh, improve my contrast. As you can see in the video, first is the brilliant blue and then the small particles of triamcin alone. So uh, with these uh, small particles of triamcin alone settle in the membrane and in the ILM, uh, we could uh, be able to have uh, a better visualization and to remove them, I mean, remove the the membrane and the ILM properly. I usually don't do this uh, technique. Uh, I mean, it was uh, the first time that I uh, think about use some uh, triumphant law particles to have better visualization. Because of this, uh, I, I have really big problems with uh, with the with the only using triumphant alone, and it went well. I mean, the contrast was uh, were very very uh, very neat. Some it says small video. I just want to mention that. And I wanna uh, see your opinions about the use of stains or how do you use when you were uh, working with a uh, macular hole or epiretinal membranes. That's about it. Thank you. Oh, cool technique. Would like to comment, Saad, on uh, Sasamoto's uh, technique. Sure, sure, Marcelo. That's a that's a great case and. I cannot agree more. Now, from a personal point of view, I used to put a lot of triamcinolone, but I don't do this anymore. Uh, to me, triamcinolone confuses everything and uh, it stays in the eye. So I put small amount of triamcinolone, but I cannot agree more on using uh, the um, uh, blue stain. Um, but but um, from my point of view, I sometimes I have to restain a couple of times uh, to get the um, uh, perfect area to start. Um, but uh, I cannot agree more. I think uh, stains are becoming very essential um, in those days um, for our surgeries, um, especially uh, with the need to uh, remove epithelial membranes and ILMs. So, great case. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, can I ask you a question, please? Yes, Mohammed. First, yeah. You, you show it very uh, elegant technique of peeling of the epiretinal membrane. My question is, if every case of such an epiretinal membrane, you need to remove the ILM? No, no not always, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, I rather uh, maybe show you the, the OCT was, uh, the, the traction was both between ILM and uh, the epiretinal membrane. So. I decided to remove both. I ask, uh, I ask this question because every case of operating membrane, when I remove the operating membrane, I ask myself a couple of questions, a lot of questions. I will go for further staining to remove the ILM, and when I see the ILM beautifully stained, I don't keep, uh, able to keep my hand to remove this ILM. So, it's a very uh, uh, annoying for me. Why we remove bilem is for be showing that we remove the epiretinal membrane or that we just see the ILM beautifully stained and we do it right now very carefully, but we have also complications of derofing of such a nafovea or something like that. I don't have the answer until now, by the way, <laughs> because I have no answer until now. Right. I believe it depends of the of the case of. of, of 
of the macula and uh, I usually uh, as you as you said is uh, sometimes you you need it to remove it and sometimes possibly uh, there's no need just want to comment uh, um, there has been publications on double kind of membrane peeling the ELM and IOM. I think some people argue that peeling the IOM will make sure that you don't have any residual um, cells or tissues on the um, retinal surface that will prevent recurrence of the uh, epiretinal membrane. So that argument uh, seems to go along with a lot of people. And, and second thing that uh, uh, sometimes when you stain the IOM, you see that the IOM after you peel the ERM is already getting loosened. Like that. So it is actually not much effort to remove it. And in fact, at that point, the ILM is already partially detached from the retinal surface. And you may just facilitate that. I think in those situations, um, the trauma to the um, um, nerve fiber layer is probably minimal at that point. But um, I, I do agree that uh, uh, some sometimes it, it is questionable whether you needed to peel the um, IOM. But I, from personal experience, since the peeling of the IOM, the recurrence rate definitely is much less uh, in terms of the uh, the IOM comes back. Can I just add something to what uh, Wai Ching said? Uh, I, I think, yeah, the, the lots of studies in regarding the vision, there's no difference. And even uh, uh, traction on the vessels, they measured it. Uh, as well, like as an index of traction after peel on the, um, with OCTA after combined peel or no combined peel, and there was no difference. Uh, it seems that there might be some difference in recurrences. Personally, I don't peel it unless it came on uh, with the ERM. Very good. Dr. Salam have a gold rule, less is more. This is the Amen. way Dr. Salam is working. <laughs> Hi, Ahmed. I, I just try to make it simple for myself and for the fellow. Yes. But it's I hard know. to resist, but I think we know, like, if, for example, from cataract surgery, if you do the cataract surgery efficiently, the eye is less inflamed. So I think the same applies for retina, in my view. So how's it going, Hamid Salah? How, how is uh, yes. Little Rock? Thank you, sorry for joining me. Thank you so much, all good. No problem. And uh, how is the time likewise in uh, Little Rock? In Little Rock, it's now 9.32. Everything is going well. Okay. All right. And good to see you. And uh, good to have met you first uh, personally in Saudi Arabia. That was a very good time, you know? And everybody was there happy, and uh, we had a very good time over there. And Dr. Lem, you, are you ready to show your, your case? I think, I think you are still muted. So is it better? So can is it uh, can you see the screen? No. Yeah. yeah yes. There. Yes. Okay. The Let me. Uh, <laughs> I have too many windows open. I just want to find the right one first. Okay. And um, so this is uh, an interesting case. I I'm going to uh, just pause for a second here. Let me. So. Um, the um, the cases say that, um, you know people have this uh, sutured 
uh, CZ70 will be the lens that is in place. And uh, they use tenopoline to anchor them. And, and the, uh, the implant does have an eyelid, so you can thread through it and tie it. But over, over time, like after about 10 years, those uh, suture can erode and they can break. And, uh, and when they break, the, it will cause either a subluxation of the lens or, or complete dislocations of the lens. So uh, in this case, um, the, um, the lens was actually um, um, somewhat dislocated, uh, well, subluxed because one of the suture is broken. And um, so, um, so this case actually, uh, I share that with, um, um, Let me close this with um, uh, Dr. Lee um, from Hong Kong there. So the um, the technique was to um, try to thread a tenopoline through the eyelids of that uh, hole and then resuture them. And um, so by passing the tenopoline through the uh, um, the presetted area, and then uh, using a bimanual technique, um, the um, this the suture is passed through the hole, and you can see um, it has to be bimanual technique because if you just use single handed, it will be very difficult to uh, thread through the hole because of the uh, um, this kind of movement that that can be generated by uh, either the patients or uh, by the instrumentations. So once that is thread through, then you can externalize the tenopoline, and uh, and then creating the loop from that. So um, so the uh, the tenopoline is grabbed from the other side of the uh, eyelid, and uh, and then you see next that it's going to get externalized. The, the, this patient has previous uh, uh, retinal surgery. You can see all the uh, uh, scar and the large retinal tear in behind. So it's going to make it a little faster forward. And uh, so, so the uh, using a hand-in-hand -hand technique, the uh, the suture is externalized, and it was tied to a cut end of the uh, a needle end of the tenopoline, and then it will. Then we insert it into the um, into the eye through the uh, pupil and come through the um, um, about three two two millimeter from the limbus and then pull through. You can see the the looped will get through and get tied. So, um, so now. Using a that 25 gauge needle to um, to guide the needle getting through. So essentially, that uh, the tenopoline uh, is um, passed through that eyelid, and then uh, now you can tie it. So the uh, essentially then the IOL can be uh, repositioned and uh, and resuture it into the same place. Um, so so that's is actually quite a neat technique. And uh, as I said, uh, the surgeon here actually is uh, uh, with Doctor Lee together. And um, but we I figure this this still be the same problem like uh, tenopoline another 10 years, this may break. So if we have an elderly, it may, it may work well, but uh, what about if it's uh, somewhat someone younger? So um, since then, I have uh, thought of an, a different technique. So this is another patient. And uh, you'll see, uh, let me just make sure. So I decided to use a um, a different technique. So this time, instead of a tenopoline, 
I use a the a six O polling. Now this time docked with a twenty five gauge needle, and um, so I find the techniques very interesting because with the assistant helping you, you can actually thread that ten O. Sorry, the six O polling um, through the um, the uh, the needle, and then you can get through to the uh, eyelet, and then you just need to grab it from. The uh, the other end. I just want to advance this a little bit more. And oh, sorry, that was advanced too much. So you can guide it through, and then you grab it from the other end. And then you can externalize it. Sorry. It's going to do a, sorry, to a, that, yeah, so you, once that is grabbed, and then you can just pull that out from the eye. Then the next step is pretty easy and straightforward, then you just um, cut the, um, the pulling short. And then just make a, a butt at the end of the pulling. I make it r relatively large because uh, the the eyelid itself is not that small. So we, like, if you just create the same style that you do for the Yamani technique, it may not be sufficient. Then you just pull this through. Then you will anchor the uh, the uh, IOL to that side, and then repeat the same procedure on this side to uh, to cut it and. Um, And then, um, and then colorize the the rear end. And then, and then that's it. So the advantage of this modified technique is that the six O polling is much more sturdy and is not going to run in the same the same situation as. Um, the tenopolian that will break down after like 10 years or so. I'll just stop here. Okay. So this is just a, a different way to rescue a um, subluxed um, ZZ uh, BD IOL that has a broken tenopolian. And one of my colleagues now in uh, Vancouver like to use the ZZ uh, the lens uh, a lot. So now I'm seeing some of his um, um, kind of complication about 10 years, 15 years down the road with the tendon holding breaking down. And uh, so in fact, I, I have another case coming up uh, just next week that uh, similar situation with the tendon holding breakdown after um, 10, 15 years. Great yeah, thank, thank you, Professor Lam. It's nice to see you here. I miss you so much. So uh, may I ask you a question? How to yeah. pull a dumbbell inside the intravitreal if you have already enlarged the end? I mean, if you already enlarged the end of the sexopoline and you have to pull it inside uh, from outside and then inside the intricious cavity, how to how to pull it in? So uh, what I did was um, you externalize the uh, you, you thread your ten no pulling through the eyelet, then you mm -hmm. bring the um, the end out, and um, but you bring it out uh, through the um, um, 
um, the Choka area. So it's very generous. So you you kind of created the butt at the uh, end of that tunnel pulling. You pull through. You you anchor that um, eyelid, and then when you pull it out from this the insertion side where you want it to be anchored down, you you just shorten it and then cauterize it to the um, to the distance that you want. So I usually trim it down to about just a couple of millimeters as you show on the video and then and then uh, cauterize it and then it will anchor down. My first attempt was that uh, I just make the butt very like what I usually do with the Yamani and then uh, then I realized that uh, when I push then the whole thing pulls through because the eyelid of the Caesar BD is actually quite large and um, and it wouldn't catch so it was a bit um, I have to repeat the same procedure so um, so lesson to learn is that that the uh, the internal bud uh, has to be large the external one doesn't need to be as large mm -hmm. yeah so what needle do you use to dock this the tunnel? yeah this one I use a um, uh, the 25 gauge and um, long enough? Long enough? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it was actually very useful. The 25 gauge needle, as you saw in the video, I put it right next to the um, the eyelid, and uh, I just asked your assistant to push the um, the six o protein through, and uh, it will just come come out. And right, you can just aim it to the hole, and it will come out to the hole. And then you just need to grab as it exit to the other side of the hole, and then that works. Yeah, would it be better to dock it with a 30 gauge needle? Because I did one case before to dock in the 30 gauge needle with 6 proline, so the hole will be smaller and then you don't have to make a large uh, dumbbell to fixate outside the, uh, the scale. Yeah, but I think uh, a 27 gauge or 30, 30 may be a little uh, tight sure. and uh, uh, a 27 will definitely work well. Okay. Why chain? This is yeah. very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I had a little bit of experience with the um, lunch technique. Something we found, uh, if you that when we made the um, the flange big, uh, just to try to secure it more, actually you get conjunctival exposure more. And uh, I think what happens, and I see your point here. You're worried that it will go through the eyelets, like it will go out mm -hmm. through the island. Yeah. But what happens, it sticks there somewhere in the sclera, in the lamellar sclera. So you want it to be a bit small, so it buries in the superficial layer of the sclera, so it decreases the conjunctival erosion. That's our experience. And when we made it smaller, it actually like buries more, and you hardly see it, and it, the exposure seems to be less. Yeah, and I think it, you're absolutely right, uh, that the, uh, um, the external flanged, should be small so that, as you say, you can bury into the uh, uh, scurled uh, tissues and minimize the exposure and the erosions. Um, what I was trying to emphasize is that the internal flange, where it anchored the um, the eyelid, uh, should be big bigger than the yes. eyelid itself. So you need to be yeah. more generous with that one, and then yes. the external one. Uh, you do it your um, the usual Yamani technique to make just big enough that they don't need uh, they don't kind of um, get dislodged or get uh, migrated in in uh, into the uh, vitreous cavity. So you you actually I don't think you should make a very uh, excessive flanges on the external one, and uh, that will minimize the uh, erosion. And something we found to just direct this easier is to like when you cut before you uh, burn near to it, you have a mm -hmm. small cut, let's say one and a half millimeter, mm -hmm. then the flange becomes smaller if it's done this way. And then Great my suggestion. other question, have you tried Gore-Tex suture? Yeah, um, myself and, and my partner here, uh, my partner actually like the Gore-Tex. Uh, sutures, Gore-Tex sutures, sorry. And uh, um, interesting is that uh, with any suture or any French technique, the idea is to make sure that you have no exposure of that sutures because that 
increases uh, risk of um, infections. And uh, um, the Gore-Tex suture does has the, um, the concern with the exposure. And um, so. Yeah, it will need to be buried. Yeah. Yeah, no, beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lem. And uh, I would like to call uh, Dr. Skivas to present his case. Uh, Dr. Skivas, Mr. Skivas, you want to uh, present your case? You want me to, yeah. to show you or you can uh, stream from your place? I can. OK, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to show, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Uh, I would like to show um, a case of a <clears throat> child retinopathy of uh, prematurity. Um, in our hospital, we every week we have to check about 20 to 30 children retinopathy of, uh, of prematurity because we are responsible the Department of Pharmacology not only from our kids, the kids of the university, but we we cover another extra two hospitals. So we have um, a lot of kids that come to every uh, two week um, follow ups. And I would like to present the case of a newborn, which was a 24 weeks old baby, weeks of gestation, and it was and had a, um, a birth weight of 420 grams. Um, if you follow the guidelines of, um, of all these cases, also in the severe cases, you have to uh, do follow-ups uh, once a week is mandatory. In some of the cases, perhaps you have to do it also twice a week. This was a case of a baby that was, his birth, his birth weight was 420 grams. That means the, the severity of the case uh, was something that we didn't experience until now, and the situation was getting worse by the day. So they, they, during the first uh, visit, it was a, a rust disease. So there was a plus disease in, in the stadium in so one. So we reacted with uh, with uh, uh, anti-fog uh, anti um, injection, uh, and uh, the situation was good. You Sorry. Could you possibly uh, enlarge your screen? It's not full. Yeah, screen. I'm sorry. Is it better now? Yeah, much better now, yeah. OK. And after a few days, we we, we tended to see some uh, small signs that the, case, that the case was getting better. But after a few days, it was reacting very aggressively. So we had a case of uh, if a, a stadium three plus in zone three. So that means we had also to perform laser. But after a few days, it, the situation was getting worse, and we had in the left eye stadium 4A. That, was, that means it was a peripheral retinal detachment. And on the right eye, we had an almost closed funnel, a stadium 4B retinal detachment. The funnel was not closed until now, then, but we had to proceed to um, surgery. And this is the video of the left eye where we did an, the encircling band. It was a two millimeter encircling band. Um, and don't forget, this is a small eye. We have to dilate the pupil and see exactly where the fibrovascular band, the fibrovascular ring, is. And then you have to locate exactly on the on the on the sclera, and then you have to tie the encircling band. This is the the left eye, and this is the. And we did the, 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 the both eyes in one session. And this is the beginning of the video for, um, for the right eye. We have the stadium 4B retina detachment. This, in this case, I intend to open the conjunctiva so that I can go through the, 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 the sclera without putting so much pressure on the globe. The sclerotomies I tend to do them, um, I tend to measure 1.5 millimeters from the limbus because it's a very small eye, but you have to be very careful in order not to touch the retina. I'm sure you, you all heard of the so-called kiss of death. 
um, the case of that is when you have cases like that and you induce a break because those retinal detachments are tractional. Uh, they, these are not rigmatogitals. And if um, you in any case induce a break, then the case is over. Then there is no meaningful way to save a retina. So the, I tend to uh, preserve the, the, the lenses in those cases. I don't like to remove the, the, the lens. And I start very carefully. And the um, characteristic of those cases are a fibrovascular ring, which is very aggressive and it is very adhered to the retina and it tends to contract to behind the lens and it push the retina with it. So the steps are to, first of all, um, never try to do a, a normal vitrectomy because the, the cannot, you cannot uh, mobilize the hyoid. Um, and, and start with shaving mode, try to uh, remove some kind of high load in the middle of the eye and then try to remove as, as much as you can from this fibrovascular ring so that it won't be that um uh, that powerful and it won't uh, pressure the eye the retina towards the, the the center of the eye in this case removed almost i would say about 50 percent of the of this fibrovascular ring so it wasn't that powerful enough and the I opened the, the funnel and in those cases if you have not induced any break you don't need a endotamponade only air will suffice after a few uh, days the retina was more relaxed and after uh, about a month both retinas were attached and uh, I think we have made the the fifth follow-up on this uh, child and the retina is still attached. The nature of this disease is very aggressive and the success rate is uh, very low. I would say about 50% of the cases. Also, if you perform a successful surgery, um, the progression is very aggressive and these, these, those kids tend to, um, to reach a stadium 4B, that means a closed funnel retina detachment. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I would like to call Dr. Lamb, who has a vast experience in uh, our P. Uh, could you comment on the Dr. Skiva's case, Dr. Lamb? Oh, thank you. Oh, I have to say, Dr. Skiva, it, it's um, wonderful to see you that taking on this kind of uh, cases because those are extremely challenging cases and you show a beautiful uh, techniques of scroll buckling and vitrectomy. And I think you highlighted very important uh, points that people be aware is that the, um, the retinal detachment in our P are not traction, are not rheumatogenous, they are tractional and exudative. And uh, um, once you convert them into a rheumatogenous detachment, it's very difficult to uh, to manage, mainly because the, um, the vitreous itself is very firm, and they will progressively become uh, more um, adherent and membranous, and PVL set in, and it will be impossible to fix them. So uh, um, you have shown, like you highlight all the important techniques to uh, to do um, with the newer uh, twenty seven gauge. Uh, instrument, you may be able to um, be a little bit more um, uh, aggressive in terms of your um, uh, vitrectomy technique to uh, try to remove um, more of the membrane. And I, I find it too that uh, sometimes a bimanual technique, especially with the membranous uh, vitreous, uh, can be helpful. But the key is mm -hmm. to avoid uh, making a retinal break. and. Uh, in, in cases when there's a lot of vitreous tractions, but the uh, scroll buckle itself uh, can, will not be uh, sufficient. So um, in, in the, um, what you have shown, the, the, the two eye that manage differently and the reflections of the, um, the different severity between the two eyes. So, but great technique and um, uh, welcome to the uh, the fraternity of pediatric VR surgery, because this is something that most people would try to um, uh, stay away from because 
um, the um, the risk is high, and um, and the procedure is complicated. Yeah. The first cases are always a nightmare, but then after a few cases, then it's more acceptable to handle. Yeah, the technique just simply is not a modification from the adult technique. You need to think differently. Like drainage, for instance, is not needed in the, in these kind of cases. And uh, as you showed, with time, the uh, the detachment will settle. And as we said, it is a combination of exudative and tractional. So you re you take care of the tractions. The exclusive part of the attachment will go away. So, by doing more, you actually might create more risk of complications. So nicely done. It's not very easy to to decide where to stop to uh, the, the cutting procedure of the vitreoretinal traction because in any point you can induce a break and then it's over. When you see the 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 ring being more relaxed, then I tend to stop. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Congrats, congrats, Dr. Skilos. I, I have one question, sorry, uh, Hudson. Sure, sure. It's not a question. I mean, uh, it's one of my frustration when I do ROP surgery, is uh, how you think uh, the, you have removed all the yellow, the, and uh, sometimes you have to go back to the OR and do surgery again. So sometimes uh, it's complicated to remove all the yellow, uh, even if you use stains and uh, and you need to go back to the OR. It's a, that's a, what happen, usually happens sometimes. And I love your case, uh, Dr. Christus. Thank you. And so I, I agree with you that uh, um, it is impossible, not even hard, it's impossible to remove all the hyaloid because <laughs> children are, are very adherent. In fact, um, Maybe next time I can show you, I don't have it right here, that one of the cases I tried to uh, remove the hyaloid, the tractions, just removing the hyaloid can be sufficient to cause a retinal tear. And uh, so um, I think the intention is not, as I said, not to remove the hyaloid completely because that's not possible. It's to try to ad address what Dr. Scabers has done, all the tractional component, and then leave the hyaloid alone. And then uh, you're not there to remove them. And second part is that I do tell the parent that we might need to come back because things um, may be more um, uh, developed in the with time post up. There may be new attractions or residual attractions that need to be addressed. So you make sure that they understand this is they may not be just one surgery kind of uh, approach that you may need to go back to address those things. And if in your mind that you you allow yourself some um, a more conservative approach and, and accept the fact that you may come back, then you may not be, be too aggressive and, and get into trouble during the first surgery. Yes, and I remember Dr. Lam at the hospital for sick children. You know, when I was doing my uh, retina fellowship over there, I was with yeah. you in a very difficult uh, stage five ROP uh, case and uh, we, we were there for almost four hours and uh, at the end of the case you uh, found a, a small hole there and uh, uh, was it me? I don't know but uh, maybe uh, on injecting before a carbon liquid you know that happens and uh, uh, you know these are such details for ROP patients they're so tricky and uh, sometimes you got to be very careful as you said you should not remove all main brands and uh, uh, maybe it was a, a little bit forceful in the uh, flush from the APFC I don't know but these cases are you know it has, we have to we need to have lots of patience yeah those are the old days and good thing that we don't see much of the stage five anymore because of the uh, use of anti VHF yeah those are challenging times back then. Yeah. I just want to say hello to Natara Jan. Natara Jan is in a big event right now. Hi, Natara Jan. Good to see you, man. Hello. Good morning to all of you. And sorry, I got stuck in a meeting and I just came out joined. Thank you. Thank you for having me. A great case uh, watching. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good to see you. Congratulations for all the accomplishment you have. It just oh, thank keep you. coming. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Thank you. And so, uh, Saad, 
Before I call Ahmed Salam, could you present your case? You're ready because I sure. think a little more advanced yeah, sure. in your time. Sure, it's my pleasure. Uh, let me just. Um... Quick to see you, Sam. You look well, good. Same here. Same here. Same here. Thank you, Dr. Lam. It's also Hi. good uh, to see uh, you. Good evening, uh, Sad. How are you? Hi, good to see you. And again, same yes. thing. Congratulations on all the great achievements. Um, Thank I'm you. Just trying, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, um, why it's not... Um, Yeah, you are co-host now, Sad. But it seems that Sad is a little frozen. I guess it's too warm in Saudi, so he need to chill. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but uh, he's gonna join as uh, as soon as uh, he could join. But maybe if. He Maybe, uh, uh, Ahmed Salam, could you present your case and then Saad is uh, the next? Yeah, sure. Let me... Uh, share the screen. Okay, I, I have two cases. Uh, I think on uh, uh, on uh, clear buckle. We optimize the video for a clip. Um, Sorry, can you see my screen? There's a video there playing. Can you see my screen? Or? Yes, we can see your screen. You can see my screen? Okay, all right. Yes. I just want to start by this case. I have two cases on scale of buckle. Uh, this is, uh, we try to do more buckles because, again, it, it's, uh, uh, it's good to keep the scale. It's also very good for the resident to know, for the fellow to know how to do scale buckles and the way we do it is we use uh, endo elimination with just one uh, port that we put there opposite to the pathology and uh, what we do is just we look only when we, only when we need to otherwise we uh, just work um, without elimination so we only put the elimination so it's becoming easier it's more teachable uh, for the fellow so we try to do uh, as much buckle as we can. This is an interesting case here. What well, the break was, uh, there are two breaks here, as you will see with the arrows. And the breaks are a little bit on the posterior side, but I thought we can get them nicely on a radial buckle. So that was the plan, a five millimeter radial buckle here with drainage. I just want to show you what happened in this case. So here we started, uh, this is the setup is here. Uh, so we have one trocar, if you may see here, opposite to the pathology, which is infronasal. We open the conjunctiva, we had the media rectus and the inferior rectus uh, uh, hooked up. And here, and this is the pathology here, we're uh, looking at it. And uh, we were about to get the cryo and deal with it, but the problem is this. We found this just next to the localization mark. So if you might see here, this is the mark here of the two breaks. And then this is, we found this structure there. So the question is, what would you do? Would you continue with buckle or you would do something else? So, uh, I mean, I thought of trying to just get around it, but trying to put a radial buckle with the vortex vein there, I thought definitely we're gonna hit the bucket, so we did, so we converted to vitrectomy, and we just didn't want to get the problems of a buckle causing uh, effusion or uh, hemorrhage. 
or an exhilarative detachment. So we converted the vitrectomy and then we did the usual technique was uh, three poor parts of a vitrectomy, as you would expect here. Here, this patient had one a horseshoe tear, so she had uh, a complete PVD, which we again we checked with Kenlog. And now the fellow's vitrectomy on uh, one side and the other side, patient is phakic. And these are the breaks here, the two breaks next to each other. And I'll run this for the sake of time. I think here emphasis on uh, switching hands so not to hit the lens and scale indentation to look for more breaks, but we didn't find any other pathology. And these are the two breaks here. And you can see they are a bit on the posterior side. We found a tuft there that we cried. And then here we marked one break under air. And this is what we do now. We just drain from the break. We don't go to the disc. We get a less complete fill, but we feel that this you get less retinal displacement. We call this minimum drainage, minimum GANS. So we just drain from the break. We do not go to the disc and we leave the vitreous fluid. And you can see actually it was away the breaks from the vortex vein, but the problem is as the vortex vein exiting the eye, I think that was the issue. Uh, unless there was another vortex vein here we're not seeing, because sometimes they have duplication of vortex vein in the quadrant. Uh, so again, here we drain this to uh, near dry, but we do not go to the disc. This is the end of drainage here. And then we got this with cryo. And then we just uh, closed. Uh, so this is my first case. I think the point that uh, I wanted to uh, make is that uh, it just the, the vortex vein, and I wondered if you, uh, if uh, you know any of the esteemed panel would have, I don't know, maybe still put the buckle and wouldn't mind the vein because just one vein, or would have converted, or I'd be uh, interested in your opinion on this case. And then I would like to show another case which a different uh, scale of buckle uh, uh, issue. I am at such a good case. Let me ask you, because we haven't seen uh, much of this uh, cryo during vitrectomy as you showed, but this is amazing because you do identification, you see the cryo, uh, you see the freezing, you see the snowball. This is amazing because uh, do you prefer uh, rather doing that uh, rather than doing the PFC and uh, doing the laser from inside out? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. I, so what, uh, one or two breaks, I think cryo is a great tool. Uh, I think when you have multiple breaks, I would avoid cryo and use laser. But in general, I, would, I don't use PFCL, except in giant retinal tears or PVR, or maybe some selective pathology where there's an issue there, displaced blood maybe, or something like this. But I try to drain from the break. One or two breaks, I find cryo very easy. Uh, and very easy for the fellow. You don't need to drain like heavily. And uh, other than that, I would do um, laser. And I try to avoid PFCL and drain retinotomy as much as I can. Okay. And do you have your fellow hold the light pipe in case you do not, do not use it? Is why why then go uh, illumination pipe? And uh, how could you ident and at the same time have the illuminated system? Uh, no, so, so we we don't use chandelier. So you have the light pipe in your hand, and then you're indenting uh, with the indenter searching, and then after that you're indenting with the cryo from outside. So the cryo works from outside. So that's why it's easy because you don't need anyone to indent for you to do the cryo, and you don't need a chandelier. The cryo is from outside while the light pipe is inside. Very cool, very, very good. Not Any sure. comments on the vortex vein would have, would anyone have done something different about the vortex vein just out of interest? Just one comment, the, I think the concern with vortex wing um, is probably uh, underrated. So, uh, so I think you, you're right that um, should be pay attention to that. And I think one quadrant, 
uh, would not be uh, a major issue a major because issue. you have the other quadrants to uh, the drain. And the consequence of putting the buckle over the vortex vein is that you might get uh, uh, congestions, venous congestions there, and you get a choroidal post opt. But as we know, choroidal will resolve with time. It may take several weeks, but then uh, you can look at it as an enhanced buckling. <laughs> so, yeah. so that is, I think the, the thing that you don't want to happen is to tear the vortex wing and, uh, and that can cause uh, more uh, like a hemorrhagic uh, choroidal and, uh, and that could be uh, a more, um, a little bit more difficult to manage, but eventually they also settle. Um, the, um, but you can modify, as you said, you already suggest that you can modify your technique to do a radio to avoid the vortex swing. And I find that, uh, um, that may not be necessary. And, uh, the, um, if you cover more than two vortex veins, then I think you might be troubled because you, you have such a large choroidal that, uh, creating more challenges in terms of the post-operative management. So. Yeah. No, the plan was to put a, like a small, a segmental radio. Yeah, exactly. But I just found that, I, I don't know, I probably I was not expecting the situation, so I, I didn't know what to do. So <laughs> I just converted. Uh, Ahmed, yes. did, you, did you mark the brakes and it, where the brakes were at, yes. on top of the, of, the, of the vortex thing? They were just behind it. So uh, I can try to uh, get the picture. Yeah, they were... I wouldn't may, I wouldn't hit, uh, um, be concerned to buckle on top of the vortex vein. I would be like the um, uh, Professor Lam said uh, would be more concerned to place the searchers where the vortex vein is so soon to, to induce a hemorrhage. But um, I wouldn't worry yeah, the, about the vortex vein. Yeah, yeah. The the break is there. This is the mark, the violet mark there. If you can see it, yeah, it's it's this here, the violet mark. Sorry, I apologize. Was this a young patient? With a clear uh, no, lens? actually, to be honest, the, the patient had a PVD, but we thought, okay, actually, it might be nice to put a radial buckle there. And I gave the patient the option, and the patient, uh, for some reason, really just said, okay, actually, I want the buckle. And I thought, okay, well, that's cool. Let's do a buckle and a radial buckle. So, the, so this is the vortex vein. The mark was here. Because they, they, when I see the the fundus photo, the 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 brakes are to begin with relative centrally. Yes, so yeah, buckle thought, could make your life difficult. In yeah, this we kind thought of it's uh, you know it would be a nice challenge to get it, the two on a on a five millimeter buckle. We thought it would be really nice and cool to put a buckle. And when we were talking to the patient, she said it might be nice. You know, I was talking to her about more the buckle, and she said, yeah, I would actually like the idea of not having the eye open from inside i thought okay well yeah. let's do a buckle and the plan was to get like a neat nice buckle on the two brakes there so when i found this i think it just uh took me by surprise but i uh, know good to hear your thoughts and dr lamb's thoughts uh hudson shall i move on to the next things yeah uh, show it a little faster because now we have after yours yeah, uh, Saad, I think, I think Saad is almost ready. So go on, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I'll, it's uh, here. There's another case here, which uh, is, I think also might be interesting. Can you see my, uh, my, my, my video there? Or my, sorry, my presentation there? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay, so this is a 14 year old uh, chap who really uh, leads a very active lifestyle as a, you know, as a kid or an old kid, he lives on a farm and he rides horses and he, you know, he uh, looks after you know, big cattle with his family. So very active. He got hit in the eye and maybe that's a, the, the disadvantage of an active lifestyle. And then he presents with a Makoff detachment, as you can see, <laughs> with a dialysis and a macular hole. Uh, which here I think is either traumatic hole or it's a secondary hole to the detachment or both really. And vision is about just more than hand motion between hand motion counting fingers. And uh, the question is what to do for uh, this patient, uh, especially with the macular hole uh, being there. So 
tell you what I've decided. I thought, okay, well, let's handle the detachment and that hole make close because we know the secondary hole sometimes they close and there's anecdotal evidence that they close this buckle, although no, actually there's no specific literature on this. Um, uh, and also traumatic hole, we know that some of them may close alone. So I told them we may need to come back, but let's just handle this first because it may be just one surgery. So that was the plan. So here's the surgery again, same technique I showed. Um, uh, so we have the, the endo light, just a troker there to look opposite to the pathology. Uh, and I just want to say something if, uh, for the um, maybe if, uh, fellows in training uh, who are listening to us. So what I do with scale buckle is usually they are done under general anesthesia. Most patients are young. So once we put general anesthesia and before opening the eye, I would indent 360 and make sure that the plan I had before the surgery still is the plan. There are no other tears in detached retina because they may, that may change the plan. And especially that most of those patients, I was not able to indent in the clinic because they are young. Then I would just open and deal with it so as not to waste time once I've opened the eye. So I always do that. Uh, and here, so here, this is the localization, cryo. You want to make sure you got the horns. And then here, this is the um, the marking. So we do uh, oral occlusive buckle where the, for the dialysis, the anterior suture just behind the muscle insertion. And here, what we do is 1.5 times the buckle width. So this is a 7.5 millimeter separation for a five millimeter sponge. And this is the um, flat, the half cylinder sponge. We just put it here. And then we put um, two sutures there. And then this is the troker. We only use it when we need to. When I use chandelier before, it keeps falling off. So here, so this has looked reasonable. The fluid is pushed back, but the area of the tear is nice on the buckle, so we thought this is good. The only thing when we looked outside, uh, the buckle was a bit redundant, and I think the separation of the suture was not ideal. The suture should have been like a little bit on the uh, separated more here. So we did another one just to stretch the buckle. And then we always close the uh, sclera. And this is the appearance one day after the surgery. You can see less fluid. And um, and the tear is, in all the cuts, were closed and less fluid. And that's the appearance one week after surgery. Thank you. Congrats, congrats. Uh, so before I call uh, Saad, Saad, could you comment uh, Ahmed Salan's last case and uh, then you could proceed to your case? Sure. Please. Well, first of all, it's great to see you, Ahmed. Uh, Thank you. Great, great cases uh, as usual. And I think, uh, you know, um, uh, doing buckles is great. I think it's a dying art. Um, um, I, I don't, um, unfortunately, I, I'm not doing uh, much buckles anymore, but I think uh, what you've done is great. Uh, you've kept... Uh, the uh, vitreous intact for this patient and uh, I think definitely for certain cases young uh, uh, inferior dialysis um, uh, 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 inferior PVR I think uh, buckles are still the way to go um, uh, from my point of view I, I like to use the circumferential uh, 41 um, um, uh, 240 bands uh, uh, I'm not comfortable with the sponges I, I don't know maybe it's just the way I was trained um, but I think you you make it look very easy, uh, where in fact uh, there's a lot of art uh, in doing uh, buckles, uh, in putting sutures. Uh, uh, I was also trained to do belt loops, um, and not sutures, uh, but I think um, a great case. Um, I love what you've done. Thank you. So should I share my uh, screen? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, you are on stage okay. now. Okay, so I hope you can see my uh, my screen. This is a quick case. This was a patient uh, 
who was referred uh, to see me uh, initially as a, a, a macular fold. Now he um, had a bilateral uh, retinal detachment uh, treated in both eyes. In one eye, everything was fine. And in the other eye, you can see uh, when I examined the patient, this is his OCT. It looked more like an extensive epiretinal membrane that is pulling um, on the fovea. So uh, after um, discussing uh, the case with the patient, we proceeded uh, with uh, a vitrectomy. Um, this is just another OCT, um, and to me, studying the OCT is, is very important. You can see the uh, uh, fold uh, coming from the, uh, from outside the fovea. Uh, I tried to see if I can induce a PVD. It has been done because this is a second surgery. Um, I find looking at the OCT very useful in these cases to see where I can start. Um, so we managed to start um, outside the fovea, and it was a very thick, actually, a very thick epiretinal membrane, uh, which we pulled um, that came uh, very nicely uh, from the surface um, uh, of the fovea. And um, after we finished um, removing the epiretinal membrane, I, I stained a couple of times uh, with uh, uh, membrane blue. Uh, and you, you can see here, and I tried to see if I can um, uh, take an ILM, but I could not see any ILM. And I, I felt at this stage, maybe it's just safer uh, to leave things as is. And I think um, I took the right decision and the um, uh, OCT did improve within a week. And uh, um, after one month, uh, you'll see the OCT in a second. The patient is actually developing back uh, his uh, foveal contour. So in, in summary, I think these cases, uh, first of all, need to be diagnosed. Um, it's, a, it's a rare complication. Um, I think this patient has extensive laser treatment, and that could be the reason. Um, you uh, have to sit and discuss with the patient the possibility of surgery. I think this patient did well. Um, we know it's a rare complication. Uh, most likely, he had a partial thickness fold. Um, uh, compared to patients who had a full thickness fold, which will be much more uh, difficult. I did discuss with the patient the possibility of inducing a detachment, uh, specifically because his retina was flat at this stage. Um, I think it brings up the discussion of the um, um, uh, what we call as outer retinal corrugation. Uh, this uh, new um, uh, studies that came actually from Toronto um, about uh, these patients who, um, despite the fact that uh, they have good visual acuity, uh, they um, uh, tend to um, uh, uh, complain uh, because of the fact that uh, the retina did not uh, correspond in the right in the right way. Um, so I, I would like to hear um, um, what you guys think about it, and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. You you just mentioned these uh, outer retinal tubulations that that you yes oh yeah yeah it's very it's not very uncommon but I usually see them in uh, age related macular degenerations and uh, uh, you think that could be uh, helpful to do any treatment post op immediately like any anti inflammatory drugs or anti angiogenics. Do you think that could work? Um, I think you want to watch these patients first because there's a, there's a good chance that they might spontaneously uh, resolve. I think uh, I think OCT has made a major um, uh, impact in the diagnosis, the follow up, and uh, you know classifying uh, these patients. And that's why I like to study their OCT um, uh, uh, very well. Uh, they do um, improve uh, on their own now. If the fold or if the membrane is outside the fovea, usually you don't have to do anything about it. Uh, we're talking about uh, fovea involving um, pathology that you want to uh, interfere. Um, I think time is also important. The longer you leave these cases, the more likely they develop atrophy and damage, and then they'll probably um, uh, not respond. Yeah. What would you do, Dr. Lam? That was a very good case, uh, Saad, and uh, I think you highlighted uh, very important points for managing the retinal fold. I think time is uh, important, and not only that uh, uh, with time you might have atrophy, but you also get fibrosis that actually keeps the fold uh, fixed, and then attempt to uh, resolve that may be difficult. 
And in your case, it uh, turned out to be like partial and, and it was uh, very well managed. And uh, there are many reasons for retinal folds and uh, uh, we, we know that um, um, post-operative posture uh, also can minimize it because by face down, having like the, um, the gas bubble like covering the macula can uh, can be uh, very helpful, even though in those cases that is uh, like not involving the macula, the fluid can dissect into the macula post-opt if you don't take the precautions. So, but uh, once it is there, um, it is important to study it to understand uh, whether you need to manage. I think uh, really depending on the nature of the fold, if it's from the, from the membrane uh, on the preretinal membrane, then uh, it, it is possible that it can be managed relatively easily by either by observations or by by intervention like this. But if it is involving the uh, the entire retina, then the, the challenge is to um, um, to go back in and uh, detach that area to undo the fold, and that is not an easy procedure to do. I agree. I, I think I think what you said is great, uh, Dr. Lam, and I think we tend to see this more with the very bullous um, uh, retinal mm -hmm. detachment. And I just want to go back to what my dear friend, Dr. Salam, say, less is more. And I think mm -hmm. we want to do as, as much less uh, in these cases. It was very tempting to try to fish for the island, but I felt um, I just want to stop here. The fovea looked fine. So um, I'm happy I, I did uh, stop in the right time. And I agree with less is more. I think it's a beautiful model for retinal surgery. Yeah, and the uh, the shape of retina is much a lot a, a lot better. And I usually tell patients that uh, I was uh, talking about that lecture on uh, intraqua tamponades. That uh, sometimes if you have this detachment, that your full retinal detachment, uh, even if if you want to treat the, the retinal detachment with uh, intraqua tamponade, the gas you should attempt if the retina is so detached that the macula to do the steam roller uh, positioning so that you squirt the liquid off the brake and then you avoid the likelihood of having folds. And uh, I think this, these things are, are good to teach the patients as well. Can I have a comment on this? Can I comment uh, quickly on folds? Yeah, you're talking about uh, 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 folds. Uh, I yeah, no, the uh, Doctor Sad's case. Yeah, well, I don't think I, I think he's observing for a while. No, Doctor Sad. Uh, yeah, well, when when I saw the patient, he's had uh, been at least six months uh, post. I think they waited for it, but. Um, I think his vision was not very good. His other eye, uh, despite the fact it was going through the same detachment, but it's done very well. Um, so I think that's why the patient was concerned. Uh, go yeah, ahead. No, I think it was excellent decision, really, just doing the minimum, uh, especially that uh, it has been there for a while. And as Dr. Lamb saying, uh, fibrosis. And usually, they, if they have, if you have inner folds, they do good. Outer folds, if they are complete, these are the problems. But here, I think it's a different case because it was chronic, and I think what you've done is really uh, excellent. It's a great case. Yeah, great case. Uh, uh, I think I should present my case right now, or is there any anybody uh, before me to present? Or I think I was the... I think you're the only one, Hudson. Uh, I'm not the uh, last, but not the least. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll show you my case. It's a very interesting case. I was so happy about this case, and uh, uh, I consider this one as the... Uh, uh, a real, I would say, double uh, seven case. Can you see my screen? Yes. One thing I like to do is to push this thing down here, so that it doesn't stay uh, in front of the uh, uh, the screen. So let me just try to get it. It usually disappears. So once you get it, it will disappear. Once oh, you yeah. play it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's better now. So let me start my case. Uh, 
so this is uh, what I call the uh, inverted vector. So we have, let me stop here for a while, we have this uh, very large left eye uh, macula hole. So, tá me escutando aí? Tá, tá me escutando? Can you hear me? Okay, so we have this uh, large macula hole. So uh, I was thinking about uh, the slides that André Juca showed beforehand about the technique, how to close uh, large macular holes and uh, how maybe uh, to apply different techniques and choosing whatever is uh, better for, for the case. So this case is ILM stock stuffing technique for large macular holes. And uh, uh, you're gonna see during the presentation how important it was before carbon liquid to do the procedure. So you have this large macular hole, as you see here, and uh, as you compare the different cuts, it's like a target. And you see here the, how the structure of the hole is. It's measuring 640 microns. And uh, it is unfastened the, the hole itself. So it started the vitrectomy, did the core vitrectomy, peripheral vitrectomy had some uh, white, white without pressure uh, changes. You see here, because uh, I'm operated inverted, it looks like it's a right eye, but it's actually the left eye. I'm coming from down, it's above, so the image is not re-inverted. And uh, after uh, doing an effluent exchange, a complete one, I stained with uh, brilliant blue. I love brilliant blue, gives me a very good visualization. And uh, because it's a 007, uh, couldn't be, uh, even I was uh, far away from the fovea where the ILM is uh, thicker, and I was very careful, but the image seemed to float a little bit and uh, get a little hazy. But even though I was so careful, I got some bleeding around there. So uh, I was far, so not a problem at all. And uh, after I did the ILM peel, Something that I observed is that uh, I could easily stuff it in the hole very carefully, carefully because the uh, the tip is a, a blunt one. So by doing that, after I try to remove more of the ILM, uh, the problem is that the uh, the stuff in the material was coming out. So, as you see here, repeating the image, the, the, the video. So, what could I do? So, I had to do something different. So, uh, before I tried putting this thing back there, I used PFUR carbon liquid. And uh, this is the best thing I've been doing for quite a while. Because PFUR carbon liquid gets everything very stable. And uh, as you see, I could continue with the ILM peel all over. And I decided to uh, have a second hand to help me. And so from here, I stuffed it in the uh, uh, ILM inside the macula hole, but I, 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 I have this stock of the ILM holding it firmly. So I have two hands, the perforo carbon liquid and also the uh, ILM attached to itself there, so uh, the whole, the, the, the ILM wouldn't come out. And uh, I was so concerned about this that I, uh, I did this technique, maybe a modified one to sort of uh, leave the uh, ILM in situ, that uh, the ILM wouldn't come out. And for my surprise, because the uh, uh, Stuffed material was so so well put inside the hole that I see here how beautifully the hole closed. I was very happy about the results, and as you see, in com comparing the uh, before the surgery and the macular hole, 
and the target image, and you see here the pre and the post op uh, image. We have the structure very well uh, uh, formed, and the hole closed completely. And uh, coming towards the end of the case, uh, you see here, you see how the uh, the structure, the ILM zone, and the width of the uh, the retina at the fovea got uh, restored. This was was a very interesting case, and uh, this is why I consider this uh, this double uh, seven case. It was not easy to do it because you see the hole is so large. So. I ordered the uh, second OCT, the postoperative OCT. The patient was very good because uh, he was uh, probably keeping the position head down around uh, 20 hours a day, he was sleeping and everything. He was very uh, good at doing that. And then I did, because the hole uh, was a, a little chronic and large, uh, I said, no, it might not close, but it closed beautifully. And so, uh, from uh, André Jucas listing on uh, the procedures uh, and uh, the uh, likelihood of having the hole closed or not, I could put this in between a very good chance of having the, uh, the hole closed, maybe close to uh, the amniotic membrane. So I would like your comments on the case. Hudson's a beautiful case. I like really how the BFCL made it easy to steer the flap into the hole. So it really looks very nice. What gas did you use out of interest? Oh yeah, I usually like using SF6. And of course, I, I give a concentration not non-expensable. I usually use, uh, because non-expensable concentration will be 18 to 20 percent, I put 25 percent, and I like a very large arc of contact so that it stays mm -hmm. there for, for, you know, maybe two weeks, at least two weeks or three weeks, it, it's very good, and uh, uh, I don't have this uh, intracore pressure raise. <coughs> So I did not have any problem with uh, uh, high pressure, usually like SF6. Sometimes I use uh, C3F8. In this case, I could probably have used C3F8 because, because the, the uh, hole uh, is a, was a chronic one, uh, almost one year duration, but has the potential of closing. So I might have uh, better used the C3F8 because of the chronicity, but then what moved me to uh, use SF6 was uh, to avoid complications, and uh, th that went very, very well. A lovely case. Fantastic. Congratulations, Ray. And so uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you, if you compare the techniques, uh, why do you think and I will tell you why I think the hole closed. What did I do different in such a case? Could be uh, the blood from the attempt to peel it uh, far away from the fovea, the blood could uh, have the, uh, uh, some, uh, I, I remember, uh, remember Dr. Lem, Dr. Deveni used to uh, use the blood to actually, uh, he, he centrifugated blood before uh, the surgery of macular hole, and then after the surgery and after the exchange, he would inject the centrifugated blood. So blood has some uh, properties that could help on closing the, uh, the hole. Another thing is that by using that stock uh, at the, uh, uh, from the uh, edges of the uh, ILM where you peel it and they're putting inside the hole, the stock would contract, and this contraction would help in closing the, uh, the hole rather than just putting the stuffing technique, just the, you know, the uh, autologous uh, ILM inside the hole, and so, and to wait until it closes. So by uh, having the stock around the retina, the ILM 
still uh, attached to the hole after, uh, during the uh, post-operative uh, time uh, period, then that would contract and then you close the hole. And so this uh, uh, last uh, step of the procedure, I think and this technique uh, could well have uh, closed the hole, even though it was chronic and it was a large one, and it helped closing because of the contraction of the ILM. This is for me what uh, made it close. And another thing that I like very much, now I'm using more and more perfluorocarbon liquid. People think, no, you use perfluorocarbon liquid, and then after you pull the ILM, it's going to go back down. But I don't think so. It makes everything more stable. And I really consider that as the uh, second hand for me because the perfluorocarbon liquid sort of stabilizes the ILM, so you keep pulling it without pressure and uh, you have much more control. But what do you think about this, uh, Dr. Lam? I think you have a wonderful result. And as you mentioned, I think the, uh, uh, the preferred carbon fluid helps to stabilize things and allow you to move the membrane without having it pops out from the hole. Um, I'm always amazed how <laughs> different techniques manage to close the macular hole. There's so many different techniques, inverted flap, multiple flap, uh, amionic membrane, autologous, and um, so, and also amazed how the hole will close when it looks like you should not get closed. Um, I have to say, I still try to understand it. I, I don't fully appreci uh, appreciate the, the mechanism, but I think your suggestions that the uh, the residual uh, tractions on the um, edges of the macular hole with the IOM can help to uh, bridge that. And that most of the explanation people offer for the use of IOM that they are filled into the hole is to uh, they serve as a scaffold of um, bridges to allow the uh, the two end of the um, um, macula, the two end of the macula, the two edges of the macula hole to come across. I think in your case there was quite a lot of cystic changes uh, of the uh, edges of the hole pre-op. I find that it's a good sign. Like those cases tend to close much better than those have no cystic changes. Those flat open hole are the one that uh, is a challenge to, co to close and those are the one that you will need to be more um, uh, thoughtful of which technique that will work for them. But uh, those with the cystic changes, I think once the uh, the cystic changes de decongest, uh, they, they do slide towards the center and that bridges the defect that was there. So, and, and I think your case show beautifully of that. Well done. Thank you, thank you. Now, I'll keep doing that with the four carbon liquids. And uh, I'm gonna rely on the force of that stock that I'm putting in, inside the hole to contract and even close larger holes and holes that have adherences uh, below the hole, understand? Because there is a technique that you know well that we detach with uh, a uh, saline solution BSS, the, uh, the retina under the hole to make it more elastic. But sometimes the retina there is kind of stiff. So it's difficult to make it elastic if it's long standing, for example. So if I uh, use this technique after it adheres and heals, and I think the contraction from the ILM, which is held by the ILM itself at the edges, so that could make a difference in closing the hole. So I think after doing a couple of cases more, maybe five cases or six, and I will have uh, this uh, idea, and then maybe we are coming up here with uh, uh, different and uh, cool technique. Thanks a lot for the comments, and uh, uh, I'm happy to, so we have presented all cases, and uh, if anybody wants to comment anything else, So, Dr. Lem, I would like to leave it up to you to close the session. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, 
Well, first of all, I think Hassan, thank you for organizing this to give opportunity for everybody to um, share their excellent cases. And I think that without the participants, like all the presenters, we wouldn't have uh, um, this kind of beautiful uh, exchange of um, ideas and uh, techniques. So I thank you and I encourage you to keep this going and uh, looking forward for the next sessions. And every time I come, uh, there's always something to learn. And I think the, uh, the benefit of the entire experience is the exchange of thoughts. And uh, the uh, discussion is always the one that I take most um, kind of learning pros and tips from the, from the group. And, uh, and that's how we always uh, been improving ourselves and, uh, and hope this will continue. Thank you for doing this. Our Is it Jan want to have the last word? Yeah, oh, no, no, not last word. I, I came <laughs> late, sorry. But I enjoyed it. I, I really resonate what you're saying. And I think this particular forum, we really have a open discussion and finer tricks, small tricks we keep learning. In spite of all the experience, I think you see some other surgeon thinking differently and each one asking, very nice, that the hats and should keep going. And I apologize for missing it in the beginning. Thank you for calling me, Arsene. Okay, Natarajan, you and Arun, you are probably out of India for most of the year, since a long time. <laughs> yes. This is good, I should meet you soon in the, probably one of your events as well. Thanks a lot, thanks yeah. everybody, thanks Ahmed, uh, Olivia, yeah. and uh, uh, Marcelo, everybody that participated in, in all the audience as well. And uh, we appreciate your presence. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Hudson, are you coming to the Cartagena meeting? The Roma, I thought. I haven't yet. I'm more concentrated okay. by the end of the year, and I want to invite you guys from uh, Retinason to participate in Oftalmo Cordoba in Argentina. Cordoba, Argentina, we are organizing the meeting with the Retinason session over there. And uh, okay. also the uh, meeting. Uh, I should participate in the meeting from uh, France, from the French Academy of Surgery, because I'm a member there, and so I should be presential there by the end of the year. That's why I'm more concentrating by the end uh, of the year on those uh, events. But I invite you all to uh, Oftalmo Cordoba. You'll be a presential meeting with uh, some uh, people presenting online as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Skivas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 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 thank you. Obrigado. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Right. Right. Obrigado. See you. Hasta la vista, Olivia and Sasamoto. Hasta la vista, Hudson, Dr. Lam, everybody. <laughs> Natalia. Hi, Marcelo. Yes. Hi, <laughs> yes.